This episode is brought to you by CuriosityStream, home to thousands of nonfiction documentaries from some of the best filmmakers in the world. Follow the link below to start your free trial today. Since before the beginning of the space race, people have looked up at the stars and wondered what it would be like to live on other planets. The more optimistic among us have long held that humans are destined to become a multiplanetary species, and maybe they're right, despite the big problems we face on our current planet, which is vastly better suited to supporting life. The prime candidate for a second home planet is Mars, though Venus is also enticing. A handful of eccentric visionaries like Elon Musk have even gone so far as to develop semi-concrete plans of how to build a functional permanent colony on Mars. Whether you think this kind of plan is likely to succeed or not, the idea of a large Martian colony is fascinating. In this episode, we're going to consider what it would take to sustain a colony of one million people. First, let's compare specs on our two planets. Despite their obvious differences, the red planet and the blue planet do have some things in common. For example, thanks to their similar rotation speed, one day on Mars is only about 44 minutes longer than a day on Earth. The red planet's axial tilt is also very similar to Earth, at about 25 degrees to our planet's 23. This means that Mars undergoes similar seasonal and temperature variations. Both are rocky planets with metallic cores and similar mineral composition. They have similar surface structures, including mountains, canyons, and deserts. But the differences between the two planets are much more significant than what they have in common. Perhaps the most significant is the Martian atmosphere. Unlike on Earth, the atmosphere on Mars is very thin, only measuring about 1% of the Earth's atmospheric pressure and completely unbreathable for humans. It's composed of about 96% CO2, 2% argon, and 2% nitrogen, with trace amounts of oxygen and water vapor. This stark contrast leads to another. Mars is drastically colder than Earth, averaging negative 46 degrees Celsius, with brutal lows of minus 143 in the winter and highs of 35 degrees Celsius in the summer on the equator. Mars is also very dry and dusty, and is buffeted by frequent sandstorms. The planet also lacks any reasonably sized magnetosphere. What little remains of its magnetic shield measure between 16 and 40 times weaker than Earth's, which leaves Mars susceptible to harmful cosmic rays. Gravity clocks in at about 37% that of Earth, which would be a small challenge to overcome, but nothing compared to the temperature and lack of atmosphere. One final problem is the lack of liquid water. Mars does have water at the poles, but it's mostly frozen and nowhere near the amount we have on Earth. Any successful Martian colony would have to contend with these big problems, and fight to establish any kind of hospitable environment on what should be considered a world hostile to life. So let's tackle those challenges. The first big one would be setting up a habitat that could support large numbers of humans, protect them from the cold and frequent dust storms, provide breathable air, safe drinking water, a way to produce food, and a shield against lethal cosmic rays. No big deal, right? Step one would be a large enclosure to act as a central hub for our one million Martian colonists. This has often been envisioned as a city beneath a big glass dome, providing light but also protection from the elements. Elon Musk has also speculated that this could be a good formula for his Mars colony, saying that a pressurized glass dome with parks and plant life could be a very pleasant way to live during the long process of terraforming Mars into a more hospitable home. But in order to have a functional colony beneath this utopian dome, you'd need a way to power it. The current frontrunners for powering a Mars base are solar and nuclear, depending on who you ask. Solar obviously comes without the risk of accidental irradiation, but it will require a lot of land area for solar farms. That shouldn't matter though, since Mars is currently nothing but open land and the colony will be fairly small. The settlement would also need large energy storage units for the frequent periods of darkness caused by violent dust storms, which could also damage the solar panels. Assuming we get the power working, the next critical step would be food and water production. In theory, food would be easy enough as long as the colony has access to plenty of water. We have very advanced and highly productive hydroponic farms here on Earth, and there's no reason we couldn't do the same thing on Mars. You don't even need natural light or soil, so the farms could very easily be built underground for saving space and added protection. It's likely that a Martian colonist would have to be okay with synthetic meat or an entirely plant-based diet, because shuttling livestock to Mars might prove to be a bit too challenging, not to mention the added complexity of keeping large numbers of animals healthy and fed. Establishing a secure and consistent source of oxygen and water is probably the biggest hurdle in building a colony on a largely airless, waterless world. One proposed solution is to extract carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and split the molecules into carbon and oxygen. It would certainly be easier to make an automated atmospheric CO2 extraction system than a fully autonomous mining rig with excavators and complex equipment to pull CO2 from the soil. But that is another option. As for water, NASA is currently investigating the possibility of extracting water from underground reservoirs and using highly efficient recycling methods to reduce the overall demand for fresh water. Whether there's enough subsurface water on Mars remains to be seen, but another option would be sourcing ice from the poles, which could be processed into clean, usable water. 
To make a long story short, we'd have to look at Mars as the British did the Americas, which comes with its own set of ethical concerns, but that's another topic entirely. We could supply the initial and essential components to jumpstart a small outpost, but in order to scale up to include one million people, the Martian colony would have to become completely self-sufficient. It would have to make use of the materials within the Martian environment, because relying on shipments from Earth would be both incredibly expensive and very dangerous. If the colony had no way to produce its own oxygen, for example, and something went wrong with the shipment from Earth, there would be a very real risk of all the colonists dying. The proposed solution here is to develop technologies that work with the Martian environment instead of fighting against it. We've already seen promising proposals for methods of making building materials from Martian soil, such as a process called molten regolith electrolysis, which is a fancy term for using electricity to break down silicates into their base components in a single step. This has the dual benefit of creating a metallic alloy that can be used for construction, while simultaneously releasing oxygen that can be harnessed for life support systems. All of these things are critical to establish a successful colony on Mars. But the most important aspect is the colonists themselves. We'll need scientists and technical experts, but we'll also need normal people with a knack for fixing things. People who can think on their feet when something goes wrong. Find a new way to use an existing tool. Think creatively in order to make Martian life more meaningful. Those are areas where humans excel. We've got a long way to go before the technology is ready, but our species has been prepared for a long time. If you'd like to learn more about the daunting challenge of preparing for a Mars colony, I highly recommend you check out Packing for Mars on CuriosityStream. It's a fascinating documentary that highlights just how carefully we have to plan our Mars mission before humans ever set foot on the Red Planet. If you watch my videos, you'll know that I'm a big fan of CuriosityStream. It's an online streaming service with thousands of nonfiction titles from some of the best filmmakers in the game. You can find tons of great episodes like Packing for Mars, and they've got a bunch of material on technology and outer space, which are some of my favorites. Their giant catalog includes content on science, nature, astronomy, technology, and lifestyle, among others. Unlimited access starts at just $2.99 a month, and as a special offer just for you guys, you can get a free trial by following the link below. CuriosityStream is available on just about every platform you can imagine. So wherever you are, you'll always have access to great, interesting content. As an added bonus, your CuriosityStream subscription now comes with a free Nebula subscription. Nebula is a new streaming platform built by and for creators like Wendover Productions, Real Engineering, Kurtzkazakt, and of course, Second Thought and many others. It's a place for us to try new things and make original content that just wouldn't be possible on YouTube. Give CuriosityStream a shot and get free access to Nebula when you visit curiositystream.com slash secondthought. If you enjoyed this episode, consider dropping a like. If not, a thumbs down. While you're here, check out some of my other work. I have videos on all sorts of topics, and I bet you'll find something you'll enjoy. Remember to subscribe if you'd like to see more episodes like this one, and click the bell to be notified each time I upload a new video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.